Monster Guys present a Yokai podcast presentation, bringing to life, through short stories and informative discussion, the strange, the beautiful, the whimsical, and the mystery of Japanese yokai. Now please enjoy a story titled The Disappearance of Aikawa, written and narrated by C. Michael McGannon, presented by the Monster Guys. This is part two of The Disappearance of Aikawa. If you missed part one, go back to last month's Yokai Tales podcast and listen to The Disappearance of Aikawa, part one. The link to part one will be available in the show notes for your convenience. Part two of The Disappearance of Aikawa The earth shuddered as I ran. Several Gashadakuro surrounded me. Miles away and yet too close for comfort, only watching. I wasn't sure what had become of the woman previously hovering before me. I expected any one of these inhuman beings to pursue and destroy me at any moment. I had vowed to discover the truth, if it was the last thing I did, and I knew it may well be that moment. My mind raced as if to keep pace with my feet. I heard the woman in the air behind me, or at least I assumed it was her. The sound coming from her was too smooth to be a cackle full of madness, with a bitter edge, and couldn't really be described as laughter. The sound floated behind me, keeping with me as I ran, and then flew up into the night sky. A sudden wall of green and brown appeared before me and I tripped and stumbled, falling into the huge surface before me. My hands and cheek impacted with the thing first, immediately feeling the tacky surface. I noted a feeling akin to slime, Pulling back with great fear in my heart, I looked upon what had brought me to a halt, and what would surely be my doom. To my disbelief, I peeled away from the slimy surface to behold what my eyes tried to convince my brain was a giant frog. It turned its head and regarded me with one rectangular pupil, the blackness of void that made me think simultaneously of deeply held intelligence and something completely beyond this life. A small gust of wind caressed the back of my neck, rustling my hair, and I began to sweat. This is it, I thought. She has caught up with me. This is the end of my journey into the other world. I squeezed my eyes shut, remembering visions of the day before. My class, regarding me with disbelief, Tarada's hesitant smile and his furrowed brow as he poked and prodded at my mental stability. I waited for death to come. Would it hurt? Would she impale me with those vicious red claws? Would she devour me, as some female demons often did, or simply drain me of my life force to sustain her own? When nothing happened, I opened one eye. The giant frog had returned to sit straight forward, clearly looking bored of me. I slowly turned around, deciding that if I was going to be given the chance, I would face my death, seeing her for what she truly was. At least I would die knowing what I had set out to learn. The woman watched me carefully as I turned. My heart turned to ice as I looked upon her again. Her green-tinted skin barely marred her beauty, which itself was severe and frightening, cursed by hatred and anger that stained her features. Her presence and movements spoke of royalty, indifference, and grace, while her clothing, which much had been stylish centuries ago, was rich yet worn. Her long black hair was kempt, and her nails and teeth were expertly manicured and maintained. Ah, she said, her voice still imbued with the edge of spite. For a moment, I was beginning to think you were a simple coward. I said nothing, knowing that many yokai would use your own words or actions against you. Behind me in the silence, I could hear the frog take a deep breath. I had never considered what a frog's breath might sound like. She waited for me to reply, but grew impatient. Or perhaps you are a coward after all. Why have you come here? It was odd. Her dialect did not sound as if it belonged in another century. It sounded masculine, and as if she were from the early 20th century. Please, great spirit, I wish not to be tormented or toyed with. If you are going to kill me, do it quickly. 
The green woman looked me dead in the eye, and after a moment she burst into more of that raucous sound that I was loath to call laughter. Forgive me, you're much braver than I originally thought, she cackled. In a confused blink of my eyes, she had rushed forward and had me by the throat. I was pressed against the giant frog behind me. The slight sensation of slime seeping through my hair and clothing registered second to the sensation of her claws gently piercing the sides of my throat. I do not wish to kill you, you stupid man. I wish to know about the outside world. She released me and I fell to the ground, clutching my throat and coughing from the burning crease inside. My name is Takiyasha Hime. I am the witch who resides in this region of the Land of Darkness. I know of you, I said in a near whisper. I couldn't believe it. Your father was Tyro no Masakado. He... He was a good man, she said, her severe eyes shutting me up. He did not deserve the Emperor's betrayal. How is it that you're here, I asked. Here, in the Land of Darkness? she asked with a smirk. Are you asking why I'm not in one of the deeper hells? That is not what I... I am not dead. Not by your definition. I simply chose to leave the world of the living on my own terms and rebuild a life here. But you were defeated. Your army was destroyed. She turned away, and I could feel her tiredness, as if this was not the first time she had heard that statement. Your history books are inaccurate. It is true, my army of skeletons and frogs was met and destroyed. I escaped, however, coming here. Originally, I planned to overtake the Empire, but I found other conquests. Another life in the Land of Darkness. It is better here. The world is deadly, and the demons and spirits are malevolent and plentiful. But I prefer the honesty of this world to the traitorous nature of humanity. She looked off into the sky, seeing what in the black void I did not know. I cleared my throat, seeming to catch her attention again. So you were not going to kill me? No, though I have left that world behind, it is still lonely here and for the most part unchanging. I wish to know about the world, how it has changed, whether it has improved. Come. She gestured to the giant frog, which at first meant nothing to me. Then I remembered that she and the legendary Jiraiya rode into battle atop their giant toads and frogs. But it was too late. Impatiently, she grabbed the back of my neck and leapt from the ground. I found myself thrown onto the back of the creature's bumpy, sticky skin. Takayashi Hime floated down in front of me, grasping the frog's sides. In a much older dialect than the one she had been using to speak to me, she commanded the frog to go home. The great beast turned, bounding forward. I felt as if my skeleton would be jarred from its fleshy shell to be added to the sorcerer's army with each powerful landing of the frog's muscled body against the blackened earth. I struggled to find handholds on its back, in turn feeling disgust when I did find knobs and bumps to grab. It did not help. Once I was even thrown from my belly down position, but Takiyasha Hime's arm whipped out like a snake and grabbed me, placing me back behind her. You are not an able-bodied man, she called over the rushing wind during one mighty leap of her frog. I only mumble in response. My life's pursuits had been academic. Of the mind, not of the body. When the world inclined upward, the frog now jumping up the wall of the mountain, Takiyasha Hime had to hold me in the air by the neck. Somehow she remained seated on the frog, despite gravity and despite the fact that we were now at an 80-degree angle from the ground on those sharp mountain edges. When finally we evened out again, she tossed me to the ground. I land as gracefully as I could on my hands and knees, finding the ground to be sharply ridged, yet smooth between those ridges. Looking up, the castle stood before me, strong and formidable, almost as if it looked down back at me itself, not liking what it found. Please, said the frog witch, come in. We entered through an open courtyard. Flowers bloomed here, impossibly bright and healthy in this dark, rocky world. A fountain poured a midnight liquid down into the earth, flowing somewhere I could not see, with a small footbridge of smooth, tan wood and red railing passing over the stream we were crossing. It was altogether unearthly, and yet I felt a sense of compassion while standing amongst these vibrant fragments of life. Takiyasha Hime passed by me, and I felt the earth shudder, turning to see the frog hopping away. 
the Gasha de Kuro, to my surprise, were nowhere to be seen. The clearing we had passed over from the forest was empty from my viewpoint, above near the mountain's edge. However, I was chilled to the bone, as I saw that it was not a simple clearing at all. It would have been difficult to see at ground level. Giant outlines of skeletons etched into the obsidian ground, curled into balls or stretched out below. They're the forgotten, Takayasha Hime called from her grand doorway. Forgotten by all but me, and very angry. Here in this life, most of them have begun to sink into this world, finally finding peace in their slumber. But not all, I said, remembering the giant I had run into before. Not all minds can rest, even after their battle has long passed. Those who still wake help me protect my abode from the demons and spirits who wander this land. She turned, disappearing inside. Was it a trick of my eye, or had she grown paler, softer? I followed her into the towering structure, wary of the firelights that floated in the entryway. Alone in the first room, which was decorated with magical trinkets and old artifacts, I continued forward into the long hallway. As I watched the room stretch forward for what seemed like forever, black ink poured down the walls, faces appearing in the wrong way, said Takayashi Hime, suddenly behind me. She pulled me back into the entrance room, away from the hallway of horrors, and showed me a door that I had completely missed before. Eventually, she led me to a sitting room, where two cups of tea were already prepared, fingers of steam reaching for the ceiling and dissipating before they reached their destination. She waved at the table, gesturing that we should both sit. The frog witch looked different now, younger but weary. Her skin was no longer green, and the malice across her face had faded into something else, a gentler countenance that I could not identify. She looked up and I caught myself staring, quickly looking down into my tea. Is this safe to drink? I asked, then quickly amended my words. For me, I mean. You are wise to ask. Yes, you may drink it. As long as you are with me, this world will bring you no harm. Now, tell me, what all has happened in the world of the living? Since your time? No, no. Tell me about the last few decades. As I said before, you are not the first to wander here. I wondered who else had been here before. I decided to start out with the introduction of the bullet train in the 1960s, and worked my way through current events from that point in time. I was surprised when she asked me about the oil crisis, and it took me a moment to realize that she was speaking of the event in 1973. She described it in enough detail that told me she knew of its beginnings, but not its outcome. With a more firm date in mind, I told her about the resolution to the crisis, how it helped Japan rise from its defeat in the Second World War, and of the economic highs and lows our country had experienced since then of the so-called lost decade that had shaken our international standing, the rise of delinquency and crime, and the tsunamis and earthquakes that had ravaged Japan in recent years. What is a nuclear plant, she asked, after attempting to tell her about the meltdown in Fukushima? I took a deep breath, delving into another history lesson. After that, we spoke of the Olympics, and then about political parties, the innovation of the cell phone and social media, of a world going digital, I'm not sure what I should have expected, but her response was surprising. They still sound lost. They? I asked, unsure of what she meant. Humans. I shook my head. It is the way of the world. It was strange. Was my modern era to her ears, as her era was to mine? A fairy tale of sorts. I have hope. I had begun to say that I had hope for the world, but in truth... Was that why I was always looking back into the corridors of history and mythology? Her eyes pierced mine. No, you do not. Otherwise, why would you be here? What would drive a man to look for the land of the dead while still among the living? Do not answer me, for I already know the answer. I sat there, speechless and unable to deny her words. It is time for you to return, she said. But I have so many questions. But you've found your answers, have you not? The answers you said you came for. The truth. How will they believe me? My voice came out so quiet, it was hardly a whisper. A scratch. Takiyasha Hime smiled at me. It was the smile of one who pities another. 
but she was not wholly condescending. Why do you need them to believe you? She stood, her voice becoming hard again. I will walk with you to the edge. I wasn't quite sure what she meant at first, but I knew that I couldn't question her any more. She led me through the maze that was her castle, and out through the garden. I watched the green shade return to her skin as we passed through the garden over the tiny footbridge. Sadly, I became afraid to look upon her once more. Thank you, said Takayashi Hime. It has been a long time since I have received a visitor. I have not seen my mortal friend Isogai visit in some time. And as man grows more reliant on their newspapers and cars, I see less and less fall through the cracks of that world. I decided not to remind her that we had progressed beyond the age of print and newspapers, instead saying, I appreciate your hospitality, princess. Thank you for not killing me on sight, or for poisoning me. She smiled, and underneath that green mask of malice, I thought I could see the woman I had briefly known inside the castle. Stay well, Aikawa. Do not fear what comes next. What comes... Before I could finish asking, she shoved me from the mountaintop. I felt a scream rip from my lungs, seeing the mountain and Takayashihime rush into the sky as I fell. I sat up, gasping for breath, sweating, and grabbing my steering wheel. My car seats, the door handle. After a frenzied moment of panic, I stopped flailing around and found myself back in my car. It was night, and I was parked at a walking distance from Yamotsu Hirasaka, the entrance to the Land of Darkness. I checked my phone, the battery almost dead, and found that it was the morning after my exploits into the forest, early before the rise of the sun. There was nothing to do but sit and collect my thoughts for a moment. How had I ended up here? Magic? Had I simply been dreaming this entire time? No, that's impossible, I thought. I know what I experienced. I found my keys and started the engine, driving off under the black morning sky. My struggles continued, which was not surprising in the least. I returned to the open arms of the university. As expected, word had gotten out that I was under too much stress, and that my one-day vacation had sorted me out. And honestly, I did try. Tarada came into my office one day. His friendly smile entered first, like a man peeking from behind his shield. Aikawa-sensei. Tarada-sensei. We missed you in your absence. Are you feeling any better? Better, I bristled, knowing exactly what he was getting at. Well, yes, it seemed like you had been a little distraught a couple of days ago. Tarada, I found it. The entry to a world beyond our own. Tarada's face grew pale, his shoulders slumping a little. Is that so? You don't believe me, I said. I understand. Why would you? Aikawa, I think... I do not care what you think. Please leave my office. Perhaps I was a little harsh, but the lack of evidence of the world I had visited had doomed me just as much as my slip of the tongue two days prior. I write this now in hopes that my message reaches those willing to listen to my words. I am going back to the Land of Darkness, back to find Takayashihime, or whatever else the other world might have for me. Maybe I will die on my way to find her again, killed by Agasha de Koro, or some other horror. But maybe I will make it back, find the new way of living she spoke of down in that land without the sun. My earthly possessions I leave behind. They don't matter anymore. If you find this letter, do not look for me. I found a new purpose in life. This world has given me all it has to offer, but her world, there's so much more to discover and learn. Do not follow in my footsteps. I was a fool to do what I had done, but blessed to have found a being so hospitable. Even going back, I fear for my life this second time. My name is Aikawa, and I have found what I have been looking for. Michael, in my opinion, the story just got better with part two. I know it's one big story, but we broke it up into two parts, and uh, waiting for the second part, I was pretty excited to see what happens next, and it just got better. I'm glad you think so. You know, it's not like 
old fairy tales or old yokai or quite on uh, Japanese horror stories and ghost stories. It's not like they're big action movies with high flying adventure and everything, but you know, most of them have guys going up and fighting demons and such. So I was a bit worried while writing this one that this one would kind of bore people to sleep, and I'm glad that it didn't get that reaction. No, I think just the opposite. I think people appreciate a little bit of depth and every once in a while slowing down the pace for the sake of story. This particular story you wrote in kind of a Lovecraftian tone. And I think that brought out some very rich elements in the storytelling. Why don't we start there? Start with that aspect of writing this story. There's so many different yokai involved in this story, you know, so we're not pinning down a singular yokai, but this was a different take classic storytelling. Yeah, I mean, we do have some yokai in there. I was trying to focus a little bit more on the historical figures as well. The narrative itself is actually inspired by a style of writing that Lovecraft often used, you know, first-person narrative that's kind of a, a recorded journal entry. And it was something that he was actually criticized a lot for, but as much as Lovecraft is criticized for not being a good writer, he seems to stick around <laughs> quite a lot. So yeah, I think and, he did something right. And gets uh, more and more influential as, it, as we go. Yeah. So the one thing... I'm sure whoever's listening didn't skip through to this discussion, so I can go ahead and say it. The one thing that usually frustrated me about Lovecraftian stories is the person writing the story would die or go mad at the end. But it was kind of funny. It would say, you know, they'd be writing and you'd hear them say something akin to, uh, I know the beast is coming for me. Oh, look, it's outside my window now. And now it's coming and and then it just stops. You know, if a monster's coming after me, I don't think I would be writing what I see at that moment. I think I'd get up out of my chair and leave. Well, unless you're mad. <laughs> mad, true. Or Monty then, Python. <laughs> then you might just sit there and watch the whole thing unfold. But I wanted to kind of leave this off in a place where you're not really sure what happens to him next. He concludes his story, and his story does go on, but we don't get to see what happens to him next. After yeah, now, and now you're going to have people asking for part three, what happens to Aikawa when he goes back to the other world? Well, we'll see. That actually leads to the, the next thing that I kind of wanted to talk about, the traveling to the underworld and the coming back from that. It's actually something you see pretty often in stories. You see more people going to the other the underworld, obviously, but there were a f- quite a few people who actually would come back from that. Um, one of them was Ono no Takamura. Sorry, I, I still have to look down to read Japanese names sometimes. Yeah. He was actually... That's ad- okay. I think people forgive us. <laughs> At least so. we admit it. <laughs> yeah, we're not, or I, I'm certainly not like a world-class linguist by any means. Not yet anyways. But he was actually a government official, like a historical figure. There were stories told of him that he was actually like an advisor to Lord Enma, or the guy who basically decide if people go to hell or not. How would you like to have that job? That, that'd be a tough one. Who, the advisor or... Lord Enma himself. The, the guy making the decision on who goes to hell. or I mean, there are a few that maybe I could pull out and be an easy pick, <laughs> but maybe I shouldn't say that. That was that was mean. But, you know, I think everybody <laughs> has that sentiment at some point in yeah. their life. But yeah. what a job that would be. Yes, okay, you're in. No, you're out, you know. And he was, I mean... The one club you don't want to be in. Lord Enma was kind of scary looking, but a lot of people will still remind you that he had a a softer, gentler side as well. But Ono no Takamura was an actual human being who worked in the government and was a court official. He was up in the world of the living. He was known as a good man. There's a story of a farmer who dies and uh, he basically wakes up in this long line of people going through Lord Enma's desk and being chosen to get sent to hell or not. And he hears a voice say, Basically, you know, don't send this guy down to hell. I know him. He's a good man. Send him back up. Give him another shot at living. And the farmer looks up and he sees none other than Ono no Takamura. And the guy comes over and talks to him and he's like, you know, don't tell anybody about this. This is kind of just a secret side job. Um, I'm not real. you know, it's not good for people to know up there that I work down here every night. And the story goes that he would basically go to a well every night and climb down the well into hell to carry out this job nightly. So the farmer goes back to earth, basically, and he can't help but tell somebody the story. So the word gets out from there. But it's just kind of funny to me that you have this land of the dead and you have this one guy who's just a government official, but Somehow he gets the side job of going down as an advisor to 
basically a lord of hell. I'm not really sure how you get that job. Yeah, I don't know. I, you you got to have some connections, pull some strings somewhere for that one. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to pull those strings. So you have a couple of stories like that where you, you see a transference back and forth between, you know, the land of the living and the different worlds that people go to in the afterlife. And I kind of wanted to reflect a little bit of that in this story. Well, I think you did. Let, let's go back to the beginning, because there's a character that shows up that to me was really fascinating. And I guess from a Western standpoint, always seems to be out of place for me. So it always catches my attention. And when he first appeared in this story, I'll be honest with you, the first thing that came to mind was this was the invisible wall, the Nurikabe. And then it you started talking about the tacky feel. And I began thinking, wait a second, this isn't a wall. This isn't a wall. What? And then I re remembered there's some frog magic going on here and, and <laughs> yeah. the frog witch here. So uh, it was the giant toad. It was the giant frog. So fascinating to me, that character. Talk to us a little bit about that, the frog magic and the frog witch that's prominent in this story. To me, it's really cool because it's it's not something we see a whole lot in ghost stories, but you see them with historical figures, funnily enough. Uh, fans of popular culture, of anime, particularly of shonen, will have seen giant frogs at some point. Naruto is probably the best example today. It's a very popular show, and you have Naruto's mentor, Jiraiya, who rides a giant frog. Um, he uses sage, can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's basically like a sage art of ninjutsu. And the sage art is taught by this older couple of frogs up on a mountain somewhere. I am well versed in this <laughs> art of ninjutsu myself. The frog magic ninjutsu? I was trained by the great frog. That's it. It is a giant frog spirit. I, that's not true. <laughs> I wasn't really. I think I would have picked up on that. But I've got some pretty sick moves. Jumping? Climbing walls? Yeah, that's about it. Okay. That's about it. I, not the climbing the walls part, I was just the say, jumping. Climbing the walls is impressive as it is. Yeah, no. Nope. We did a series on witches a while back, and we talked a little bit about familiar magic or animal magic or the sukimono sorcerers, basically, in Japan. Primarily, you see people using kitsune or fox spirits, or you see them using snakes. And some will use dog spirits as well. A big part of that, though, is also frog magic. And you don't see that very much, but you do see it with characters like Jiraiya, who is an actual historical figure and uh, folkloric figure, not just the character from Naruto. Mm -hmm. And you also see it with Takayasha Hime. And she specifically was the daughter of Taira no Masakado, who was another historical figure um, that we actually talked about in the first part of this story. And after her father was kind of betrayed politically and murdered or killed so that he wouldn't take over the empire, although it doesn't really seem like he was actually trying to do that. She kind of went haywire and started summoning skeletons and giant Gasha Dokoro skeletons and frogs and other yokai. And her plan was, according to legend, to go and take over the empire in revenge. And uh, she was actually taught by the great frog spirit, the same one that you were talking about a second ago. <laughs> the one who taught me ninjutsu. Yeah. And it's jumping. It's just, it's pretty the cool. The art of jumping. The art of jumping. <laughs> <laughs> Defeat enemies in a single bound. <laughs> It's pretty cool, though, because it's, it's unique. Um, some cultures look at frogs, and they actually think it's an African creation myth that the frog basically took, like, took the role of uh, you know, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It's the, mm -hmm. the seed of all evil. Right. But in Japan, frogs are seen as, they're seen as animals that bring good fortune. The word frog in J Japanese is actually kind of like a homophone for the word return. So they, they think of it as like a return of good wealth. So they're seen as magical animals in their own right. That's all very cool. There's another aspect of this story, and, and some people who follow us very closely might hear the name and remember, but it's a name that courses through a lot of your writings when you're writing about yokai, and that's Isogai. He showed up again in this story, and uh, he's shown up in several of our yokai tales, but I thought it was interesting that he showed up here again as well. Well, yeah, Takayashi Hime talks about somebody else who would kind of come and, you know, just shoot the breeze with her and kind of give her updates on the world 
current events. And it's about the the time that he would have been <laughs> doing all of his great deeds. But I, I thought it'd be fun to throw him in there. You know, who better to traverse between the world of the living and the world of the dead than Isogai with all of the other crazy hijinks he gets up to. Yeah, I think the last story Isogai was in, I think it was titled Talking Heads, when he carried around the head of the great demon and they had a conversation together. It was it was kind of humorous, but it was cool to see him show up again. Yeah, and that's the other thing is, I, you know, a lot of yokai stories end with horror or somebody dying or something crazy happening but some end on a softer note where it's just kind of you know this happened and it was cool and they went on with their lives and i think that story had that aspect and i think this story kind of has a little bit of that well this story has kind of an internal cliffhanger (laughs) where we never know what's going to happen next well you don't (laughs) see him die i should say (laughs) And I think part two of this story is where more of your Lovecraftian tone came through in that cosmic consideration of bigger questions. And of course, this is a short story. It's not a full length book. It's not even a novella. So it's hard to go super deep or in depth with a lot of those questions. But you can certainly hear the tone with what Aikawa is struggling with and then just his resolve and his surrender to this path. I think a lot of that big cosmic thought came into play in this part of the story, which was cool. And again, it was one of those things, slow it down a little bit, let's enjoy the story for what it is versus a special effect or some grand trick that takes place to to turn the story. We're just following this guy as he's journaling his experience. And I I think it was a a cool take on a yokai tale. Well, thank you. I'm glad it came across well. Again, I I just didn't want to put people to sleep as they're driving down the road. (laughs) So part one, we really hone in on the Gasha de Koro, and we see them prominently figured throughout the story. And then we see the frog witch appear, but we don't know who she is. Second part, we get to know her. We see more of the skeleton, the giant skeletons, but they're not as prominent than we see the frog. We see, you know, various other inferences of creatures here and there. So again, it wasn't a story that focused necessarily on the creature or anything that they were doing as much as a journey or a path that was being uh, unfolded before us, which I thought one part of that that did point out some creature aspects was the graveyard where the giant skeletons were sinking into the earth versus remaining awake. Talk to us a little bit about that because I thought that was a cool scene. I mean, well, Agasha de Kuro, they are, they're basically created from the remains of warriors on the battlefield. And if you can imagine that, actually, after writing the story, I was trying to think of what it would be like to be an amalgamation of dead warriors. You know, a lot of yokai and other Japanese monsters are creatures that started off as a natural thing and through some event, whether tragic or just fantastic in some other way, or just by being too long-lived in some cases, they become something monstrous or fantastical or weird. Magical. Mm-hmm. So I was I was trying to just like I was trying to think about what it would be like to be just this huge mass of minds and spirits that would probably be holding on to the moment of their death or the moment of chaos in which they were dying on that battlefield. What would it be like to be just a bunch of voices in your own head screaming bloody murder as you're dying? So my thought was, you know, it it would make sense that these creatures are as violent as they can be and, you know, have a tendency to eat people alive. What would it be like to live on in a land that doesn't really change in in an afterlife, so, so to speak? And can you ever let go of that? And so some found further purpose in that world through serving the frog witch, and some just surrendered to that final demise. And just kind of as the story said, they were sinking into the earth, which I thought was a, I thought it was a great piece of symbolism for perhaps what they experienced at the end of their physical life, carrying into that underworld or that spirit life. Yeah, it's sad, and uh, at the same time, I don't know, maybe peaceful. It's it's difficult 
considering that the world of darkness is just that it's a it's a land of the dead it's it's not one of the terrible hells of jigoku but it's its own little entity <laughs> yeah so at the end of it all we see aikawa actually come to realize that this great and terrible witch is actually a compassionate and kind and purposeful uh spirit that is continuing on and has made her way in this world. By her, he finds grace and release, which leads him to want to go back for more, which perhaps, unfortunately, we'll never know <laughs> again <laughs> what he finds upon his return. But at least we know that Aikawa found his purpose and there was some resolve there, which is also uncommon in a lot of <laughs> Japanese folklore. A lot, And we've talked about this before, on this podcast that a lot of Japanese stories uh, are there to entertain. They're not there to really make a point all the time. They're not there to have a resolution. But here we have one that has some resolution. Some resolution and then a cliffhanger. And so, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm sort of satisfied <laughs> in my Western mind <laughs> of needing resolve. I did think it was cool that Aikawa stood up to that other professor and was like, get out, I'm done. Well, so good for him. I think that at the beginning of the first part of the story, you know, he's built up this great reputation for himself. He's he's accomplished much in his career. And he finally gets to a place where he thinks that he can share um, his passion with the world. He can share his beliefs with the world. And it kind of tears him down. And it's in the second part of the story that, you know, she shares that bit of wisdom with him. You know, why would you need them to believe you if you know you're right, basically? And it, it's reflective of her own struggles because... You know, after her father died, she went on a, a rampage and then she retreated into this world and just found her her own way. You know, why would she need to take over the empire? Yeah, and I think it's a great mirror held up to our own modern world, the things that we struggle with and how we're beaten down based on beliefs or convictions and so much going on in the world today within the media and politics and everything else that plays into that. And at the end of the day, we really, through kindness, through love, through compassion and empathy and, and all those things, we should be able to stand up and declare who we are and what we believe and uh, what we're convicted of in this point in our lives and share that with other people without fear of being destroyed. Unfortunately, our world is such that that may not ever happen again, at least not in the broader sense. I think in smaller communities it will, but I think it's, um, it's also a good reflection, this story, that there are so many people who are just like, listen, I'm done. Get out of my office. I'm going back to the <laughs> underworld <laughs> and uh, just take it from there. Seek out their stories. Seek out just further understanding and wisdom and let that story continue to unfold. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this part one and part two. Again, if you haven't heard part one, you can go back and listen to both of them now together. And we encourage you to do so. Uh, it's always a privilege to share these stories with you. Always, you can find us at themonsterguys.com or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look up The Monster Guys and we'll be there waiting for you. We love to interact with you. And thank you so much to people who are supporting us on Patreon, also leaving reviews on iTunes. If you enjoyed this episode or any of the other episodes that you've been listening to, whether it's our Monster Guys podcast or the Fairy Tales podcast or the Yokai Tales podcast, please leave us positive reviews. Visit us on Patreon. Talk to us through the website, through Twitter, through Facebook. We love hearing from you and appreciate every moment that we have to spend with you. Until next time, by the way, we're going to be taking a break from our yokai tales podcast for the next couple of months we'll still have some posted we're not going to be releasing new yokai tales podcasts another month or so we're going to do a different thing in july and august on the podcast uh, but don't worry we're still writing and going to bring you some fresh stories in what we'll call season three of our yokai tales podcast but we will have some other things in place of that on the monster guys podcast some special entries these next couple of months. So again, thanks for listening. We appreciate you. And until next time, have a great week. And if you run into something sticky and tacky, go ahead and turn around. It may be a frog witch, but she may be wanting to lead you down a positive path. It's deep. I don't, I don't know if I was going to say something snappy, but it's deep. That is deep. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.